Tonight we're talking about the disciples of John the Baptist and their characteristics. Class seven and everything I need to know about Jesus I learned from John the Baptist. John's disciples fasted. That is one thing that comes out in three gospels. We learn from Matthew that then the disciples of John came to him saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And that was a question that was put to Jesus. Does anyone want to reply and share what the answer was? Why Jesus' disciples did not fast? Roger. Was it because he was still with them? Well, that's right. That, that's part of it, yep. Yeah. And because they were celebrating his arrival, like the bridegroom. Yeah. But he was with them. The bridegroom was with them, and it was a time to celebrate. So, but one thing John's disciples did was fast. And John's disciples prayed. And certainly that is something that both fasting and prayer are things that Christians can be doing. Thank you. Thank you. Luke 11, 1. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. I just realized that maybe we don't have enough teaching on prayer, how to pray. Of course, right after this, Jesus gave us what's called the Lord's Prayer. And there certainly is a lot of good example and model in that. John's disciples were numerous, enough to make religious leaders scared to say anything against John. Uh, I probably should have highlighted this. His disciples believed John was sent by God and that John was a prophet. And it says here, since that is what all the people are convinced of. George, could you do our first reading of Luke 20, verses 1 through 8? One day as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priest and the scribes with the elders came up and said to him, Tell us by what authority you do these things, or who it is that gave you this authority. He answered them, I also will ask you a question. Now tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why did you not believe it? But if we say from man, all the people will stone us to death, for they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where, where it came from. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Tonight's lesson is on the disciples of John the Baptist. And then I picked this passage because it helps us to understand what they believed about John. They believed his message was not from man. They are convinced that John was a prophet. They are convinced that his message was from heaven. And he was telling them about the coming kingdom of heaven that would be fulfilled by the Messiah. And this uh, Verse, this section is paralleled in Matthew 21 and Mark 11. Also, I see that John's disciples were loyal. They wanted him to be successful. They're concerned about the increase of his message. And here they seem a little bit jealous of Jesus' success. Lynn, could you read John 3? It's uh, 25, 26, 27, and 30. 
Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. John answered, he must increase, but I must decrease. Mm -hmm. So we can see that John's disciples were concerned about purification. And this, I would think, is about baptism, but it may be something else. We know that Pharisees are busy worrying about uh, washing of hands and pots and uh, different things and how specifically purification should be practiced. Well, John baptized and Jesus' disciples baptized. I think it's the same baptism until Christ's death because the Holy Spirit hadn't been given. But John told his loyal followers, he must increase, I must decrease. Now, these disciples, the ones that asked this question, had missed some key points from John's lessons. He's all about announcing the coming of Jesus. He's pointing everyone to Jesus. And the, these guys are perhaps loyal to a fault. Let's see, Roger, could you read Matthew 11, verses 2 and 3? Now, when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Mm -hmm. So John's disciples were loyal to him when he was in prison, and he was able to send them on a, on a mission. And this is a, this is a good example for us. We, we do need to be visiting people in prison. I must admit, I have not done that very often. I only remember doing it on a couple occasions. Does, does that, do any of you all have experience uh, visiting people in prison? Um, for a couple of years, I went to the uh, Marion Correctional Institute. There, um, we did a service um, once a month, and they were quite attentive. They were... Um, you have no problem getting people in jail to understand their sinners. That's for sure. Hmm. In fact, they were always asking, you know, um, what do I have to do to quit repeating it? They wanted to change, but just didn't seem to could find a way out. Yeah, that's frustrating. But in that <clears throat> place where all the rhythm of their life is broken by the prison, some of them took the opportunity, perhaps even if they were just bored, maybe they would listen. And you say they were attentive, right? So it, it certainly... Yeah, they were quite attentive. Some of them were quite knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. um, many quite repentant. Um, Julio had milit carried a, killed a state trooper, and he had went to, um, went to, ended up going to Lucasville. Mm -hmm. But um, he was repentant, but they just... They just had hard, um, hard impulse. They just weren't good at impulse control. That's for sure. Yeah. And so John's disciples visited him in prison and he sent them on a mission. And we talked about in different reasons why John sent them on this mission. Are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? I had suggested that it was because he wanted to send them to Jesus and hear it from Jesus himself. They're, these people are still too loyal to him. John's going to go away. He's going to de decrease. He needs to make sure all his disciples get to Jesus. And I think that's why John did this. John may have had his own questions about it. That's a possibility. I, I don't think there's any harm with John asking this question for his own benefit. It's nice to get reassurance, but definitely the answer Jesus gave was he did some miracles right then and there. 
and it aligned exactly with what Jesus said he was going to do, and it aligned exactly with Old Testament prophecy. So Jesus is exactly the Christ, the Messiah. He is the one that was to come, and they need not look for another. That'll be picked up again in 9. So John's disciples were, hmm, all right, fill in the blank. We'll, do, we'll look it up. And the people were, I think you could probably guess. I'll fill it in. It's repentant and expectant. And perhaps John's disciples were expectant as well. I, I have no doubt about that, given the message. One thing about John's disciples, they put themselves under John's authority. They came to John in the wilderness region around the Jordan, away from Jerusalem, to be baptized. I don't know how much authority there is out there other than John the Baptist. Let's see, either Ken or Jeanette, could you read the next three verses from Luke? Luke 1, 5, 1, 13, and 3, 2, please. Um, in the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. The word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. So, he is a prophet. But not only that, his dad was a priest. Not only that, an angel came and announced that, that he was going to be a, a messenger of God. So John's heritage and the respect of the people were additional factors that could contribute to the nervousness of the Jewish leadership, the high priesthood included. That would be Annas and Caiaphas. Now here's a pretty long section. I don't know how much we want to read of this one. There are some key highlights that we want to look at here. In here it talks about the varied backgrounds of the disciples of John. So in chapter 3, in verse 12, I'm going to highlight that. It says, tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than you are authorized to do. And others were soldiers. In verse 14, soldiers asked him, and what shall we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation and be content with your wages. Now, does anyone want to remind us why tax collectors were uh, thought to be generally corrupt at that time by the Jews? Because they collected more than they were supposed to. They, they, were, they weren't honest people. And I also think that the, um, you know, because they were Israelites, the other Israelites took offense that they would be working for the not Jewish, well, only nominally Jewish government under Herod. Um, and so, you know. But it was for Rome. Right. And it was for Rome. And so they felt like that they were not loyal to their brethren. Traitors. Traitors all. I remember that Zacchaeus, as soon as he 
became a disciple of Jesus, he said, and if I have collected any more than I should have, I'm going to give it back, uh, I don't know, fivefold, threefold, sevenfold, I, I don't know, how, but he was going to give back more than he had taken because he really wanted to repent and to show that he had a change of heart because it was definitely the expectation that he had taken more than he should have. Now, these soldiers, how nice was the, the Roman government? And I guess one nice thing, they had pretty good roads. <laughs> but on the other hand, Ken Holt, uh, what were some of the negative aspects of the Roman Empire? They invented the concept of decimation. Oh, decimation. Yes, I forgot about that. So that means they, uh, do they kill every tenth or do they only let one tenth survive? Which is it? They killed only the tenth. Every yeah. tenth. Yeah, they killed one tenth. They killed one tenth. Yeah. Yeah. And w when did they do that? Under what situations? Well, when they, when they captured a group of people or... Uh, city or... <laughs> when they captured a group of people or a city, mm -hmm. they would they would uh, decimate it uh, in order to show their authority mm -hmm. and to set an example for the rest. Yeah, and probably to make them easier to handle a, a smaller crowd to deal with. Yep. Didn't the Roman Empire, um, didn't they worship gods? Now that's another uh, negative aspect. Uh, there were false deities that were being worshipped that when I was in school, we were uh, forced to study. We, it was our, our mythology class, but those were serious deities to some people at different points in time. Well, it, it, and it also, because the Christians wouldn't worship the gods, didn't that anger the Romans? And didn't, that make, didn't they make it worse on the Christians because of it? Yes, it was true for the Christians. And true for the Jews at different points in time. At, at different points in time, the Romans sometimes let people uh, be and worship as they want, but at other times they were forced to join in and there was definitely an idea of emperor worship at, with different, with various emperors. And so here these soldiers are told not to extort money from anyone and to be content with wages. But they weren't told by John, as far as I know, nor, in, nor were the Christians, they weren't told, you need to quit your jobs and quit working for that lousy outfit. And I must, and another group that you don't often think about as disciples of John the Baptist are Pharisees and Sadducees. You have it in Matthew 3. Oh, Matthew 3. Following. Thank you. Okay. Ken, can you read verses 5 through 10 of Matthew 3? Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all region about the Jordan were going out to him. And they were baptized him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. So when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping in with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able to, from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So this is a very encouraging passage. Now, I usually don't think of it as an encouraging passage, but these Pharisees and Sadducees were not sent away. They were told to back up their repentance with deeds to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. 
As he said, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. It's a warning. And some of these Pharisees and Sadducees did become disciples of John. We certainly have clear evidence of Pharisees becoming Christians later on. And so they may be some of these very same disciples. So now specific disciples of John that, that we know about, or a few that we have speculation that might very well be disciples of John. Uh, George, could you please read verses 35 through 42 of the Gospel of John? The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who had heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. So spelled out clearly for us, one of them was Andrew. Now the other one is assumed by most people to be the author of the Gospel of John, the Apostle John, who was also an apostle of John the Baptist. There are a couple places in there where it seems like he's referring to himself in a way of humility, where he doesn't give his name at different places in the Gospel of John. I think it's a, a reasonable assumption that, that John is the second disciple. I hadn't heard this one. Uh, Philip has been suggested as a possible disciple because he was from uh, Bethsaida, the town of Andrew and Peter. I'll, uh, Lynn, can you read verses 43 through 45, please? Mm -hmm. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and Nathanael Howard, and said to him, we have found him of whom no Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So I don't think it's a, a strong uh, bit of evidence that Philip is a disciple of John the Baptist, but it's a possibility. So I threw it in there. But here's a, a definite John the Baptist disciple, the famous Apollos. You see, Roger, can you read for us Acts 18, 24 through 28? Yeah. <clears throat> now, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately things concerning Jesus, but he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who, through grace, had believed. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that Christ was Jesus. So this is a disciple. I, I assume he's a disciple of John because that's the baptism he knew. Yet he did learn a lot about Jesus, and that's good because John the Baptist was teaching about Jesus. So he got some of the teaching, but he probably got disconnected from teaching of the apostles. But he knew about humility, just like John was humble. 
and realize that the coming king, he would not even be worthy of un untying a, his sandal strap. And here he was willing to be taught by a man and his wife about the true baptism. And he continued to powerfully refute the Jews using the scriptures, because it says it there, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. So he was not out promoting himself. He was bending his service to the Spirit of God and sharing what the Spirit of God had to say through the scriptures. All right, Jeanette, could you read for us Acts 19, 1 through 10, please? And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples and he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 men in all, and he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So, 12 followers, he calls them disciples, that also only know about John's baptism. And that may be because Jesus' disciples were baptizing, even though Jesus wasn't, uh, prior to the day of Pentecost. And was there really any difference between being baptized by Peter and being baptized by John the Baptist? Essentially, couldn't you say that the Apostle Peter, when he was baptizing before the day of Pentecost, was that really John's baptism? I think I could make the case because the Holy Spirit uh, had not yet been given, and that's been made very clear. And on the day of Pentecost, baptism involved the Holy Spirit. Maybe these people had been taught by the uh, apostles, but... Uh, but not the apostles after the day of Pentecost. Here's an interesting one that could be, and I think there's more evidence for it, that Joanna could be a disciple of John the Baptist. She was wife of Chusa, Herod Stewart, or household manager. And this could be because John the Baptist was prisoner in Herod's household, and he often went and spoke to Herod. Herod wanted to hear him preach. So, Ken, can you please read verses 1 through 3 of Luke 8 and Mark 6, 20? Soon afterward, he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. And also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmer, infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. And Joanna, wife of Chosa, Herod's household manager. And Susanna and many others who provided for them out of their means. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man. And he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed. And yet he heard him gladly and he heard him gladly it probably did hurt him to have to be trapped into killing john it seems clear he really didn't want to kill john 
I think he wanted to find a way to politically and gracefully get out of his sin. And then later on, he wanted to hear Jesus. So we're talking about John the Baptist's disciples. And so I put here, in John's own words, the ultimate goal of a true disciple of John is Jesus. That is the ultimate goal of a true disciple of John. So, Lynn, could you please read for us just uh, down to through verse 36, please, uh, in John chapter 1? The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came, baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now, a little bit later in chapter 3, there are some more words of John the Baptist. I didn't think it would be appropriate if I put the words of John the Baptist in red, so I highlighted them in yellow. Mm -hmm. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, I must decrease. John is clearly making disciples of Jesus. The whole goal is to prepare the way of the Lord. In Acts 13, verses 13 through 40, Paul has this sermon. And in there, he gives some insights into uh, John's mission. I'm going to pick it up in uh, verses 22 through 25. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. And so that message continued to be part of the gospel message. Those words of John the Baptist that were not worthy, uh, at least John wasn't worthy to untie them. And, but somehow in Jesus, a Christian's going to be greater than John, and which is mind-boggling given how great John was. So, I think I, I really need to enjoy with a fervor the Old Testament scriptures. Look at, look at the excitement and love of God and devotion to, to his word and his holiness that John the Baptist sh has shown. And he only had the whole Old Testament. And he did have 
the spirit of God. He did have a message direct from God, but he did share the scriptures of the Old Testament. And he probably learned them as a youth from his father, Zacharias, and his mother. What was her name? Elizabeth. Elizabeth, thank you. Any thoughts about an example we can get from these disciples of John the Baptist? I mean, repentance keeps coming up over and over again, and that's a, that's a pretty big deal and seems to be a difficult hurdle for some people to overcome or to get over. Sometimes it's pretty hard for Christians to repent, right? We repented once, and it seems yep, to be sometimes, enough. Sometimes, yep. And to do it again seems a uh, little, little much. We, we get used to our ways. I, I know sometimes I fall into bad traps and habits and influences, and it, it takes repentance to get out of it. It's kind of like anything else, admitting you were wrong. And people don't like to admit that. Yes. I know I don't like to. <laughs> I've definitely been wrong a lot. <clears throat> In programming, though, it, it's easy to admit you're wrong because the whole process of building the thing is, is trying something, being wrong, and then trying again. Well, there's also humil humiliation because if you're a Christian, you don't like, you don't want to think that you're sinning and you don't want other people to think that you're sinning because you're a Christian. So therefore repenting and repenting in front of other people, you say you sinned and you really don't want people to think you sinned. You know, we know we all sin. Okay. The, granted, we know that, but admitting that and having someone else do you understand what I'm saying? It, it can be humiliating. Yes. I, I do remember the Apostle Paul uh, trying to use that to his advantage by saying that he was the chief of sinners uh, because he persecuted the church of God. And when you think about that, that's what Jesus is all about, collecting sinners. And that's the church. He's collecting them. He's washing them. He's bringing them into the family of God and admitting that we're sinners. And it can help the other sinners realize there's a, a way. And the way is Jesus. We need not be ashamed except that we turned away. We need to turn back to Jesus and be proud of him. You mentioned how a person's story of repentance can be helpful. I mean, I remember one Wednesday night when I didn't want to go to church when I lived in South Carolina, just it was around Thanksgiving time and I was tired. I didn't want to go to church, but I went and Roland Heron spoke and he had been the chef for JFK and it went downhill, become an alcoholic and almost died. But hearing his story of how he came back and, you know, became a part of the church was real encouraging to me. Plus, he put on some really good potluck stuff. <laughs> <laughs> now, he really helped the church out in a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah, you know, they had some great wedding, whatever, wherever that food is after the wedding. He did a great job with that, too. Kara Graber had a great job with food on her wedding. <laughs> wow. Well, George, you want to close this with a prayer? Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful that you're uh, that you're a loving God, and that we can we can really see that in a big way now, as we can look back and see that you sent your Son to die for us. We pray that that love that you have for us will help, always help us to be people who have a heart that John called for and that Jesus called for, to always be have a repentant attitude, and to be those who are seeking to do right by you and right by our fellow man. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.